right. Thank you, Amy, for that. All right, let's see here. Let's get started. So yeah, let's call to order and um, let's let's start with roll call, Amy. Yes, um, Chair Cancino. Present. Um, Commission Vice Chair Junio. Present. Commissioner Hobson Cord. Present. Commissioner Sanders. Present. Commissioner Perez. Present. Commissioner Yi. Present. Commissioner Delgadillo. Don't see him yet. Um, I did text and he said he's logging in. So hopefully we see him in the next few minutes. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Amy. And it looks like, like from the city, we do have um, our police chief, Scott Campbell here, who has been coming every single month. So definitely appreciate the partnership on that. So thanks for being here, Chief Scott Campbell. And then um, the new faces that everybody sees here is, um, there's Sal, perfect. Uh, the team from San Francisco Department of Public Health, so super happy about them being here. Looks like we also have staff um, from South San Francisco. Um, we got Leslie, I can never, I can't say your name just because my tongue doesn't let me do it, but Leslie Arroyo here. That's right. And, okay, perfect. And then, um, and, and Mary Jo Nunez. And I'm not quite sure who, I feel like I should know who Yoon Joon Kim. Thank you. He's our director of public works. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Okay. So I think that explains everybody on the call. All right. So um, next on the agenda, we have the reading of the land acknowledgement. Is there a commissioner that would like to volunteer to read the land acknowledgement? I'd be happy to do it. Thank you, Paula Claudine. Sure, let me just get it. <clears throat> we want to acknowledge that we gather in San Mateo County on the traditional land of the Ohlone peoples past and present and honor and with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We honor and respect the Ohlone people's long history here that reaches beyond European colonization. We honor and respect the indigenous people who lived and continue to live upon this territory and whose practices and spiritualities are tied to the land and its other inhabitants today. Perfect, thank you, Paula Claudine. All right, next up, um, I believe we have agenda review, Amy. Was everybody able to read their we got a short one this time. I know the past couple of meetings have been over two hours. So um, <clears throat> to welcome in the new year, we have a shorter one. Hopefully we do less than two hours this, this time around, but I guess we'll see. All right, sorry, Amy, I digressed, go ahead. Oh no, all good. Um, yeah, so after public comment, there's approval of the minutes, presentation and discussion from the San Francisco Department of Public Health Comprehensive Crisis Services. Then we have the election of chair and vice chair for 2023, future agenda items, and then just the regular business at the end of the meeting. Cool, perfect, thank you, Amy. Um, does anybody have any motions to move anything? All right, so let's move on to the next line item, Amy. I believe we have public comment. Is there anyone interested in making a public comment? I don't see any raised hands. Okay. And any correspondence? Nothing came in before the meeting. Okay, thank you, Amy. All right, next line item. I believe we have approval of the minutes from our December 25th meeting. Is that right? 
Perfect. Okay. Anybody? Um, motion to approve the minutes. A motion. Thank Steven. you, Stephen. And do we have a second? I second it. Thank you, Paul. Paula Claudine. Mm -hmm. um, roll call, Amy. Uh, Commissioner Perez. Aye. Commissioner Sanders. Aye. Commissioner Hobson Cord. Aye. Commissioner Junio. Aye. Commissioner Delgadillo. Aye. Commissioner Cancino. Aye. And Commissioner Yi. Aye. Okay. The minutes pass. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. And then next on the line item. So we have our presentation. I'm, I know that I, I've talked qu quite a bit about comprehensive crisis services in San Francisco. So I'm super happy for this team to be here and to present to us. Um, and I think I'm gonna let them take over. The two people who are gonna be leading um, pr the presentation is um, Cheryl Martin, who is the uh, one of the supervisors as well as the administrators on duty for, for the crisis team. And then Dr. Ricardo Carrillo, who is one of our psychologists, who is also um, part of the team and does qu quite a bit of the work um, with CIT. That's uh, the um, crisis intervention team that goes out with the police officers. And then we got our other experts here, um, Stephanie Felder, who is the director, Neftali Ramirez, who is also a clinician, um, and Dr. Sh Shivika, um, who is also a psychologist with the team. So um, I'll pass it on to Cheryl and Ricardo. Oh, please Hi, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, I am a fellow South San Francisco uh, neighbor of yours. I, I actually live near Hillside, um, and my two sons uh, both go to El Camino. I went to El Camino, went to Westboro, so a longtime um, native of South City. So thank you for having us. Um, so let me share our slide, Ricardo and um, Shivika, Stephanie, Neftali. Please pop and um, pop in and say hello. Um, add anything you'd like. Um, maybe we could do a brief introduction about our background. Um, I have a background in counseling psychology and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm Ricardo Carrillo. I'm uh, a licensed psychologist. I've been hired specifically to work uh, and develop the CIT program, which is a partnership with the uh, San Francisco Police Department and a crisis responder, um, small private <laughs> practice in the East Bay, forensic psychologist for about 40 years. And uh, I live in Pacifica. So uh, I'm also part of the San Mateo community. Who's next? Hi, my name is, can you hear me? Okay, uh, my name's Shivika. I am also a licensed psychologist. I've worked with comprehensive crisis and this mobile crisis team for about a year now. I also have experience with Berkeley mobile crisis and Marin mobile crisis. Um, and I used to work in San Mateo County for about six years. So I have a little familiarity with that um, community. And good evening, everyone. My name is Neftali Ramirez. I'm also a clinician, a PCC here with Comprehensive Crisis. Been here for about six months. Uh, I've also been employed, or I am currently employed since April 2021 with the Street Crisis Response Team here in San Francisco. And uh, thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Felder, and I am the director of Comprehensive Crisis Services. And I have been here <clears throat> for about 28 years, not as a director, but 28 years um, working for crisis services. Thank you all uh, for having our team. All right, so I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, okay, do you, do you all see that? 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Let me see if I can toggle it. Okay, good. All right, it's working. Okay, I'm just gonna minimize this. Um, feel free to um, shout out any questions if you might might have it, because I'm gonna not be able to see the chat. Um, Ricardo, do you wanna get us started? You want to just do the uh, history, do the brief history, and then I'll do the uh, programs. Sure. You want to go through the slides? So can you see the slides? I can see the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this is our mission statement to provide compassionate, culturally appropriate trauma-informed interventions that bring safety, fostering resiliency, strength, and hope to individuals, families, and communities in crisis. All right, so this is a topic we're gonna to talk about today, who we are, what we do, and who we actually serve in the community. Um, I think our history is gonna come up in a little bit, um, Ricardo. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we are a multidisciplinary team that consists of everything that you see there, MSWs, MFTs. We take on interns. Um, MFT interns, MSW interns, psychology interns. Um, occasionally we'll have nurses come on board, psychiatrists. So we're a very unique and diverse team. And um, what is one thing that I really love about our team is that when we go out into the field and we do our assessments, um, we bring in if we have a licensed uh, psychologist or a health worker, they have different perspectives and um, we can learn from each other and really provide a holistic approach um, in terms of serving the, the clients. Um, let's see, move forward. All right. And with that, we're very diverse. So we have, um, we have, language capabilities in Cantonese, Spanish. Um, what else do we have? I forget. Uh, Cantonese, Spanish, Tagalog. Um, and then we have a Russian, is it Russian, Arabic. Um, and yeah, feel free to hop in anytime, Ricardo. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think I think the, the important thing is that we uh, our team reflects the city and county of San Francisco. So we know we have a very diverse uh, population in terms of our community that we serve. We serve everybody. Uh, and so we try to match male, female, mm -hmm. uh, gay, straight, trans, uh, Hispanic, Latino, uh, Tagala, Cantonese, Mandarin. Uh, if we have Vietnamese speaking folks, we'll make sure that we are culturally competent in terms of engaging and uh, being able to serve the people in the most comfortable way because people in crisis are in, in crisis right they're stressed they're distressed they're overwhelmed with what's uh, happening in the moment so we try to provide the space to hold the people that we're going to be looking uh serving and uh and make sure that we can help determine how we can reduce the amount of distress that the families have and make sure that we can get them linked uh, where they need to go so that they get ongoing uh, mental health, uh, drug and alcohol services, whatever it is that they may need. So that's the important thing about our response. We're definitely trauma-informed, culturally uh, appropriate, uh, because we're from the community. I was raised here in San Francisco's Mission District. This is my town. So I want to make sure I want to take care of whoever it is that lives here. And that's the kind of relationship we also have with the police. And I'll talk about that when we get to talking about the different programs. There we go. All right, so let me move on. How do I do this? Okay. Um, what we do. All right. Go ahead. So we get called to uh, respond to people uh, to do uh, uh, the uh, crisis intervention. The important thing is that we we don't necessarily, our team doesn't necessarily respond in real time. There are other programs that do that. That's why we have a new program, Street Crisis Response Team, that's linked into dispatch. And these are folks that can go out and Neftali is part of that uh, 
uh, a new program that really has taken uh, helped us incredibly because they can respond in real time a uh, a clinician an EMT and a peer to people in crisis on the streets. So, uh, but we do respond and triage the people that were uh, being called to assess and evaluate to determine if in fact they are in need of a 5150 or 5585, which is the same thing for children. So our job is to hold a space, do the triage, respond in a culturally competent manner as quickly as possible and ascertain what their needs might be so that we can help uh, deal with that situation in the moment and at the same time, make sure that they're linked in the city and county of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So, so these, these are all the programs that, that we have available. Go ahead, Cheryl. So we are, um, our offices are 24 seven. Um, we respond to children, adults, anybody in San Francisco that may be in crisis. Um, they were triaging the phone calls, taking the phone calls, connecting them to the best services that we can. Like Dr. Creo said, if they need a 5150 evaluation, 5585 evaluation. So what, what that means, um, if you all are not familiar. So the 55, the 5150 um, is they are in imminent danger and danger to themselves, danger to others and gravely disabled because of a mental health concern. So um, that means that they have plans, intent and means to, um, to hurt themselves and hurt other people. And when we talk about gravely disabled, we are talking about um, they're not being, they're not meeting their basic needs. They're not, they don't have shelter. They don't, they're not eating, they're not sleeping. Um, so those are the criteria that need to be met in order for us to place somebody on a psychiatric hold. So that's the first part of the, um, the slide. So that's the crisis we, Get all the calls through our crisis line and we figure out which services they um, would most benefit. The other programs that we have is the CRT, the crisis response team, where um, we're responding to um, critical incidences in the city. So that could be um, a natural disaster. Um, like we've re responded to, um, to help and assist with other counties and when, when there was fires. Um, we've responded to, uh, I'll kind of go into more detail. There's another slide. So I will just, um, say that we're responding to critical incidents. It could be homicides, suicides, debriefings, um, anything that the community might need psychological first aid for. Um, then we have the CIT and then our newest program is the community wellness, um, hope SF sites. So those are wellness centers that, again, provide the holistic approach. So they have medical and mental health services and um, community outreach for the, for the folks living in those communities. Um, so there's more slides to come. So we'll go into more detail. OK, so here's the history. Go ahead, Ricardo. Well, I was hoping you would do the history. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll do the history. Um, Steph, feel free to um, chime in if I don't get the history quite right. So over 40 years ago, um, Child Crisis was founded. And um, that was when it was, I think, basically in um, a nonprofit that was in the hospital that ran in, for, ran in an emergency room when they saw a need, um, an increased need of children needing hospitalization or danger to self, danger to others. So I believe the program was created um, to help fill that gap and need when there was no child psychiatry or no um, mental health services in the ERs. Um, later in 1996, mobile crisis was also created for similar reasons. Um, then back in 2012, we've all merged. So, oh, I also forgot 2006, we have the CRT team. So all of these were like grassroots advocacy nonprofits that um, became under the crisis services umbrella and DPH back in, in 2012. So we've merged. And then um, lastly, in 2016, which is the crisis intervention team. Um, let me see if there's another slide. Okay, so this is um, 
When we talk about crisis assessments, um, these are the basically what we're what we're doing out in the field. If you want to talk more about that, Ricardo. Yeah, the bottom line there is that we just want to uh, clarify. We get calls all the time by family members, colleagues, um, uh, counselors at schools, wh whatever the case may be, where they have somebody in at, at risk uh, that is going to require a, a psychological, psychiatric assessment. We're going to do a wellness check. We're going to determine if, in fact, they meet criteria. Is the person in danger of harming themselves? harming others or gravely disabled. And depending what the level of uh, training is, and everyone gets trained to do these, these assessments, uh, a comprehensive way, and we are certified, actually are certified to conduct uh, mental health evaluations, uh, 5150 and 5585. So the idea there is, you know, we're gonna contact the family, we're gonna try to get all the information possible. We're gonna take a look at the history and see if in fact, they qualify for meeting criteria. We do a mental status examination. Uh, are they, you know, clear, coherent, uh, or are they really in danger and risk of harming themselves? So the bottom line is, is that uh, you know there are people that uh, maybe will say, you know, I'm thinking of harming myself. I've just broke up with my girlfriend in schools. Uh, you know, child will say, well, you know, I want to harm myself, or I want to commit suicide, or I want to throw myself off the bridge because they took my phone away, or I can't access the internet, or whatever the case may be. We've had uh, people. Uh, we've had people that we needed to hospitalize because the 16-year-old uh, was uh, seriously thinking of harming herself because she had a fly commercial. Her dad owned a private jet, and uh, and so that was the reason why she was suicidal. So you you don't know what what it is that you've got. But we have to determine if in fact the threat is real. So you know, are, are they you know truly? wanting to harm themselves? Have they thought about it before? Have they developed the tunnel vision? And the same thing for Tarasov. Somebody's wanting to harm somebody else. They're thinking about it. They've made a plan that I, they've identified who the victim may be. So at that point in time, we're going to take that seriously and see if in fact they need hospitalization. At that point in time, we may need to consult and will consult with the police department if in fact there's a risk of danger to others. So that's primarily what we're doing. And then making sure that people are linked. Mm -hmm. Once people, we determine whether they're meeting criteria, that doesn't stop there. We wanna make sure the family is safe and we wanna make sure that they have the services necessary for them to continue to maintain a balanced, safe lifestyle so they're not harming themselves. Yeah. So um, when we do the wellness checks too, um, sometimes I know one of the biggest um, hospitals in, in South San Francisco is Kaiser. And sometimes their patients are, are um, not showing up to their appointments. Um, and we get phone calls from their providers at Kaiser saying, hey, please come go out and check on our client. Um, they haven't been showing up. Um, and so they'll authorize us to actually do a wellness check to make sure, see what's going on with their own clients, providing us with the clinical background um, in terms of their safety and making sure that they're okay. Um, the psychiatric assessments, I guess there's, um, it's under the big umbrella. So what we're doing is we're doing a crisis evaluation. We're checking to see if they meet the 50, 5150, 5585 criteria, but we're also checking to see um, if they may need additional, like what Dr. Creo said, services, and we are able to link them um, to the community agencies or psychiatric, um, to, a, to a psychiatrist if needed. So when I say psychiatrist, I mean like somebody, like West Side Crisis, we have a specific drop in psychiatry um, agency or program that adults can go to. And then if if an adolescent um, is needing um, like case management or additional services, child crisis are, is able to provide that linkage as well um, until they're like linked um, to long-term treatment. So we'll hold cases um, for up to 30 days as well for linkage. All right, so I'm gonna move on. Okay, so here's the crisis response slide. Um, this is 
the CRT program. So we are responding 24 hours, um, seven days a week to any critical incidents, critical incidences that happen in the city. So basically providing psychological first aid um, to anybody who's been um, involved. So it could be, could be the victims, it could be victims' families, it could be um, citizens who witnessed it, it could be, it could be anybody. So some of the things that we respond to are pedestrian and traffic fatalities, um, community violence, homicides, shooting sta stabbings, um, suicides. So we provide case management, short-term trauma, um, treatment and um, supportive services and debriefing. So if a critical incident happens in the city and there um, is there, the agency is in need of talking to somebody to kind of process what they've experienced, we're able to go and do that and um, provide um, support for that, for that group. So those are some of our different partners um, for the crisis response team. One of the things that, that we need to uh, need to let you know is that sitting county of San Francisco, uh, we have the blessing of having uh, uh, Stephanie Felder, who is committed to making sure that anybody who who experiences a significant traumatic loss uh, has support. Uh, for burial services. If uh, they don't qualify for victims of crime, which victims of crime can, for the most part, cover that. If a crime has not been committed, Stephanie will try to find resources necessary so people don't have to really endure that kind of suffering. In addition to that, we're going to link them and be available to them throughout that entire process, meeting them in the hospital, making sure that they're uh, connected to funeral services, burial services, that type of thing, and then make sure that we're linked to provide services up to 18 months. So we, uh, we are the, uh, the, the agency that can do that and people then know that, uh, that they can respond to us and they're gonna be attended to for as long as they need to. We also get deployed. We got deployed to Northern California for fires. We got deployed to Puerto Rico during, uh, uh, after her, uh, Hurricane uh, Maria a year later because they still we're in need of, uh, of services, mental health services and trauma assessment. So we've done that. And then anytime somebody suffers a traumatic situation in their workplace or in a family, we provide the debriefings for them. And here's the dance that we recently uh, uh, started working with the San Francisco Police Department, the CIT. Uh, we got funded uh, uh, six years ago to hire five different clinicians to work specifically and exclusively with the uh, San Francisco Police Department to respond to uh, crisis situations with the mentally ill, to reduce the amount of officer involved uh, shootings and violence and excessive force and that type of thing. So it's been a collaboration. We've, you know, kind of learning and being cross trained by each other for the last six years. We started working uh, the streets of uh, the Tenderloin and downtown, getting to know who the officers were that were assigned to this, and also the officers getting to know who we were in terms of clinicians, in terms of being able to embrace and connect with people so that we knew who the community was that we're going to be serving. So since that time, we have uh, worked with them uh, cross-training. We provide some training for them. They have also trained us in their law enforcement strategies. We've also gone to Los Angeles to see their particular co-responder model that we still think might be something we want to consider here in the city and county of San Francisco. But our job is we give them, when we get called, when somebody is at risk of harming themselves or harming others and they've got a weapon or they're barricaded or there's a domestic violence situation where somebody is held, holding their family hostage, we offer the mental health information that we have as much as we can, the medical, the mental health, and possibly the jail psychiatric history. So they're aware of who it is and what it is that they're working with. If it's already a barricaded subject and they've already moved with hostage, uh, H&T hostage uh, and negotiation team, we will provide support to the family members that are there and provide whatever intel is necessary for law enforcement to successfully engage the person so they can get them out in a safe manner. 
in the six years that we have worked with San Francisco City and County, we have not lost a barricaded subject. We have never, whether H&T, uh, SWAT, uh, uh, fire department and EMTs have been available to respond. We have been able to support them in, in a safe manner so that people get the kind of assistance that they actually need. So I've been impressed with how they uh, are really sensitized in de-escalation uh, techniques and really attend to the CIT model, the uh, Memphis model to help reduce time and distance when they're working with people. And we've noticed law enforcement officers become quite competent at being able to do that and not rush to uh, have to use force. So we're, the model is still evolving. We've been working with a particular team. Uh, Lieutenant Molina heads that team. He's not wasn't able to come uh, today, but uh, we uh, we uh, have uh, gotten a rhythm going. They call us, we call them, uh, so that we can jointly attend to something where there is a high risk, uh, lethal, potentially lethal situation, and they have been quite responsive uh, to our needs in terms of meeting the needs of those clients. Uh, St uh, Shivika, you got anything else to add? No, I think you've covered it pretty well. Thank you. All right, and um, these are the pictures of the different um, Hope SF site. That's the newest program under the crisis services umbrella. So that's where um, communities, the the Hunters View, Potrero Hill, Sunnydale, and Alice Griffith communities um, have wellness center, have developed wellness centers in their communities, and then where um, we provide the holistic approach, where they they have nursing available, um, like um, physical, like basic physical um, checks, um, and then also the mental health portion of it. Um, so this is some of the. Mm -hmm. services that they have to offer. Yes. Steph, yes. you want to add more? Well, we also have Community Health Ambassadors, which is a collaboration with the YMCA. And the Community Health Ambassadors are individuals that live on these communities um, and work at the Wellness Center. And they provide, like, do help with groups, they do outreach, they help with the food banks, um, they help us to engage uh, with individuals in those uh, communities for our behavioral health team, as well as for our nursing team. Okay, and who do we see? All right, so this is a breakdown. Um, we'll go through this pretty quickly of, um, let me see if I can close that up here. All right, so, um, as you see, this is the breakdown of um, the demographics of the patients that we see through crisis. 44% um, are children, and then 55% are adults. So we see, I guess, on a, um, this, these are numbers based on field visits. So between the year 2000, to the, between the years of 2016 and 2019, we saw an average about about a little bit over 2,000 um, field visits a year. Um, the breakdown's pretty even in terms of um, gender. Um, and then the highest population that we see is uh, Caucasian and Latino Hispanics Americans. Um, majority are English speakers and um, next is Spanish speaking. Um, we see anybody in crisis, so it doesn't matter if they have insurance or no insurance, nobody is um, turned down from a crisis evaluation. Um, Stephen, did you have a question? Yes, yes, and, and Cheryl, thanks for uh, walking, and everybody really welcome through the, the slides here, and of course being here to do so. Um, and briefly here, regarding the demographics that you've, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, on, that's listed on, uh, shown on screen here, uh, between child and adult, and, and by the way, this is an area I'm still, I'm barely trying to get even, you know, a, a, a sense of, so thanks for walking through in the, on a high level, like the 51, like the 5150 and the 5585, which I assume the child, or really in the respectively, the adults and child categories speak to it, the 5150 and 5585. So my question is, 
uh, beyond these very broad child adult categories, what understandings do you have in terms of sub-segments? Because it's very expansive when we talk about adults and very expansive when we talk about children, you know, below 18, doesn't it make? So do you have any more subset, sub-segment information? Um, can you be a little bit more specific in terms of what you mean by subsets? Like, you mean in terms of the criteria that's being met? Like, um, um, yeah, maybe I'm being overcomplicated. Maybe like for adults, do you do you haven't broken down even further, like between you know eighteen to twenty nine. Oh, I see. Thirty to thirty one, and you know. Oh so uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm sure things. we can get that data if uh, if I don't. We we don't have that data currently. We do but it's something that, that we could pull data. out, right? We could pull yeah. it up. We'll have it. We have that data. Yeah, it's something that we could pull up, but I just don't have it handy currently. Do you have it? Do you know off the top? Well, let me uh, pull it. Let me find it. Go ahead. And we uh -huh. can keep rolling. We, we don't have to hold up the conversation. I, I'm just curious if, if there's any, you know, trends of usage, mm -hmm. utilization trends. Yeah, gotcha. I can um, ask a question too, sure. sorry. Um, I should know demographics of San Francisco, but I don't, excuse me. Uh, do you have a sense of um, which groups are disproportionately represented represented here, and whether uh, and do you have a sense of whether this data uh, has changed since the pandemic? Mm, good question. That would be a question that Steph Stephanie uh, might be able to answer for you. Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Uh, so I had, I had two questions. Was whether um, any of these groups um, are disproportionately represented and whether you have a sense of whether these uh, trends have changed uh, during the past few years during the pandemic? I don't know if the trends have changed as far as pulling, because um, we haven't pulled the demographics um, for this. Um, don't uh sure yeah if it's not easy to pull up no, no yeah worries. yeah i don't we don't have we don't have i don't think i don't have the latest on this and if i may add, alan that's a great point because uh the data here is shown as, as of june 2019 and clearly in the recent years that's i'm sure it, we might have some see skews or something really you know intriguing yeah it's a great great point from my experience and the data pretty much stays uh, the same, you know, with the variance of a uh, few numbers, but it doesn't really vary too much from this. Now, in the last two years, it could look a different skewed. I'm looking at last year's data that we pulled just for, I believe it was for 21, 22, to answer your question, Steve, about breaking down the category. So um, we broke it down for zero to 15, 16 to 25, and 26 to 59, and 60 plus. Are those the subcategories you're talking about? Uh, sure, yeah, I was curious. Yeah, and, and I think it's good. my question will go way beyond because I get a little detailed we, geeky. Okay, <laughs> It'll be interesting how you I mean, define the, what decided. You know, yeah, those are the categories okay. as far as age. I'm trying to look at, um, uh, the data for, oh, this is the wrong form. Yeah, I appreciate the effort. No, no need to, you know, uh, find By race and ethnicity, it breaks down either, even further um, as far as that. But the, the numbers that we're seeing here are pretty much similar as overall arching. They vary. I haven't seen them. I go up, like we see more children than adults. The variance um, pretty much remains the same. Uh, also, I'd like to add with the uh, street crisis response team, we also see the same demographics here. Um, street crisis response teams do not respond to children in crisis. So obviously that uh, that data is not going to be reflective with the street crisis response team. We can look that up after the meeting too. We can look for the racial breakdown in San Francisco and send to the commissioners. 
And we have we have a new data data person who just came on board who's actually um, looking at the data more closely. So um, if we um, if you want more specifics, you could just contact us and we can kind of pull pull it up and um, go into more detail with you with you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is a. Um, this is just a breakdown in terms of what areas we see um, folks in the field. Um, it's pretty detailed, but um, it's just a little highlight there. Okay. Um, let me see. All right. So these, so again, the, we see folks for the following danger to self odd and unusual behavior, gravely disabled, danger to others, out of control behavior. So 54% um, of the folks that we're seeing are suicidal. And then um, the odd or unusual behavior could refer to maybe psychosis, um, delusions, hallucinations, um, just could be aggressive behavior as well and when, when we're looking at the out of control behavior. Danger of the others is the homicidal ideation. So 16% of the folks that we see are, um, they're at risk for hurting other people. And then who get, who do we primarily get calls from? We get primarily from family members, providers, and the hospitals. Okay, so some more oh, numbers. Quick, quick question, sorry, Cheryl. Sure. There was the other chunk that's other. I'm sorry, did I miss it? Um, what is that other portion? Yeah, I'm not sure what that, what that other, other category is. I think, sorry, if I could just chime in. It could be, um, basically so somebody like a, a friend that phoned in, it could also be um, the suicide hotline that actually also called in because they're actually not a city city agency. Um, it could be other entities that have called in. We get calls from all over the world, believe it or not. Um, Cause usually when you look up, you know, crisis services or, or, or anything like that, people Google a lot. And so sometimes we'll get calls from out of the country. Sometimes we'll get calls from families that are out of the country, but have like an adult child that's living in San Francisco. So the, the that other could be other entities that aren't necessarily um, attached to, to, to city and county. Mm -hmm. It could also be friends too, by the way, which we do get quite a bit with a, a lot of our adult calls. We get a lot of like friends who are worried about, you know, their friend who hasn't been doing well. Um, Co-workers, um, yeah. yeah. All right, so this is another breakdown. Um, out of, let's let's focus on, I can't, don't know, um, on the right side of the, the slide where it says um, seen in the field. So we see, um, I believe this was in the same time frame between 2016 and 2019, and on, on an average, um, 1,142 um, children and 97% were successful field visits, meaning that they were face-to-face -face and we provided some kind of assessment for them, face-to-face -face assessment. Um, 2% were not seen. So that could be um, the, the situation in itself resolved or um, the family member, the parents um, did not decline the evaluation. Um, so a very small percentage are not seen. So on a, uh, for adults, 76% um, are successful. So we're making face-to-face -face contact with 76% and 24% are not seen. Maybe they refuse to answer the door, um, they're not home, 
Um, a lot of our calls are also triage and handled uh, telephonically. We have a great team that's able to triage and kind of also resolve the crisis uh, via telephone. Yes, so that's another part of it where we're able, so the, I think, I forgot what the numbers were, Steph, but um, in terms of triaging, um, we're able to link them to services via phone, providing like, referring them back to their, serv uh, their providers or referring them to the appropriate agency. Sometimes we're able to de-escalate the phone call, um, just helping the, the person on the line kind of walk through, helping them feel better, um, or linking them, or you know, just basically just talking to them on the phone. Sometimes we could operate as a, um, a talk line. And then we're also able to problem solve in, when the calls come in. I, I I have a question, um, Ms. Felder. Do you know how, how many calls a year do we get? Do you, do you happen to know that data? Uh, the total calls uh, we get a year between every type of call is about 3,000. Thank you. Um, okay. Steph, do you know more about this slide right here? It looks like based on this slide, go ahead, Steph. Oh, so this here are the, it has to do with the 5150s, 5585s. So we have the amount of those, um, the reason for the evaluation was danger to self, 212 of them are two for danger to self. Um, 17 were um, for, I don't know what the 17, why they put that down there. 212 went that they were uh, a danger to self for the adults. 12 um, were other such as gravely disabled or uh, had homicidal ideation, danger to others, with the total of uh, 224. Um, and then for the children, it's the same breakdown, danger to self, 314 of the kids um, were danger to self, and 14 had to do with others, such as maybe behavioral problems or danger to others, um, with a total of 328. And then you have the um, breakdown of the percentage that were placed on the holes. Thank you. I think that's it. Just make sure, yep, that's it. Did anybody from crisis wanted to add additional information that we might have been missing? There was a lot of information we went over quickly. Uh, Crystal? Cancino? Is my hand? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to have my hand up. Oh, but, okay. um, you know, I just kind of wanted to say, you know, just looking at the data when you're looking at how, you know, when you're going out into the field, the types of cases, and I think that data is important to look at because um, about half of the people that we see, or even more than half, are for danger to self, meaning they're not dangerous to other people, right? So that's something to kind of think about, like thinking about moving forward um, when you're just thinking about that. I know that like the way that, um, the way that we have uh, our, our, our pilot program right now with South San Francisco, we have Mika, who we've all met and we all love, um, goes out into the field with one police officer um, or, or, or a team of police officers. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Chief Campbell, but a, a, a team of police officers to make sure that the scene is safe. And, and then Mika is able to do um, their assessment. They're able to do their psychological assessment from there to see what other kind of services they would meet, need moving forward, which could be linkage. And just kind of like this, 
that when, when we're looking at that kind of data, we, we, we kind of have to think about that where, you know, if, if, if half the cases, let's just say in San Francisco, half the cases are more so about danger to self, there, there might need to be a little bit more focus on, well, what, what else are we looking there? Like, are we putting majority of our, um, our efforts into making sure that people in the home understand mental health, that there's services for them in the house um, versus danger to others, you know, are, are, are we spending more efforts being out in the, into the field and looking at public safety? So I think looking at that data is really important and to kind of really take a step back and really look at, okay, well, where do we need to spend um, our attention? Are we looking at our attention in the homes or outside of the homes? Are we thinking about public safety or are we thinking about individual safety? So I think moving forward, when we look at data like that and you know, because we're tasked with how to expand this program in South San Francisco, I just think that's something that we have to keep in the back of our head um, when we're looking at the data when it comes to crisis, because crisis is a huge umbrella. There's so many things that can happen under crisis that could be um, a, a mental health crisis, that could be a behavioral health crisis, that could be um, com community violence. And so again, like when we're thinking about crisis, I, I think unless you really know when you're in the field, um, it could mean tons of things and tons of detail. So I think that's why the, the, uh, the different stats we have there are so detailed because there is, there is importance in this little tiny detail, this little tiny number um there, there was also something that that had said and 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 i really want to highlight too on the the triage aspect of 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 crisis um because a lot of those call, calls sometimes we don't go out on them um meaning we never have to make face to face because we've been able to relink them to their current providers they, that they already have um, maybe the bystander or maybe the family member didn't know that they were already linked to services, right? Because some people don't share that information. Um, that's something on the back end that we're able to do is find out, okay, who are they linked to? Do they have any providers? Um, do they have any other, um, what we like to call them protective factors, meaning just like safety nets and like natural safety nets that are already happening that could also help this individual. That's something that we also want to think about you know, um, rather than, you know, sometimes taking strangers or taking, you know, people like from some kind of outside agency to help this person, unless it's warranted, again, like sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. We're able to help them problem solve, think out of the box, de-escalate the crisis um, before it even has to become a face-to-face. -face. So there is quite a bit of effort and quite a bit of um, de-escalation and, you know, Research, actually. And Research, right. But a lot of that work to help de-escalate a crisis also, that starts right at triaging, right when they first call, right when we're getting the information. And um, sometimes it never has to result to sending, you know, our CIT officers or sending our clinicians because we're actually able confidently to say, hey, you know, we, we're, we're gonna relink you back to your team. We've made appointments for you to see your psychiatrist or we made appointments for you to see your therapist. And we do quite a bit of follow-ups as well. So even, even if we don't see them out into the field, we still do a follow-up um, to make sure that things are still safe. The way that we try to do it is if, if, if we're guaranteeing or not guaranteeing, but if we're saying that we think that they could be safe for the next 24 hours, um, 48 hours, 72 hours, we're definitely taking on that responsibility of making sure that we can check in on them, um, call them. And if and if we need to do a face-to-face, -face, that the family feels comfortable to be able to call us back. If there is any change in behavior from the time that we saw them to the time that maybe they're in a crisis now, that's something we could help with the family. When is it appropriate to call if the same behaviors are happening over and over, if that makes sense, so. Thanks. Not in the detail. Um, do you, um, Steve, Mr. Steve E, you had a question? Yeah, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and Crystal, uh, with your familiarity, thanks for adding to uh, to the conversation with the uh, uh, with the group here on the um, 
other definitely different uh, many different aspects of you know crisis services um and in fact it, just to let you know though i have a, a variety of different questions but i'm going to probably sprinkle them so we can share share the time here uh, there is one thing that crystal just uh, one uh, thing that crystal shared that reminded me um long longitudinally uh from i think i think some of the data here and if i'm if i'm catching it right it seems uh, so what of a transactional metrics, meaning you meet the person, you do an assessment, and then you make a decision. I don't, I don't mean you, but you know, there's a session to be made, whether it's going to be a 51, 50, 55, 55, or something else. Uh, so these seem to be very transactional based data. So coming back to the crystals point of longitudinally, what try for lack of better words, what type of transformational data do you have that, hey, that program, that moment, it really you know, pivoted the person's life, kind of like that. What do we have? What what quick could you might you be able to share with that? Hope that makes sense. It does. Um, I I know from an operational standpoint, um, more of the crisis. Um, again, we have a data person who who focuses on the data, and I'm not sure if um, our director has that data handy. But again, it's if it's something that. Um, we can pull up and you're interested in learning more about we can pop possibly try to pull it up but i go ahead crystal yeah so i could I, I i could talk a little bit about that so there so on san francisco department of public health's website um there is a data section when you can look up at the data and every year the department of public health they they do put together a um a presentation that goes over all of the numbers with with these different entities. So now the, those entities could be crisis services. That could also be street comprehensive crisis. That could also be um, uh, the the other the other programs that we have in San Francisco, which is like the hot team, which is homeless outreach team. Um, so all that data gets presented to the mental health commission as well as the board of supervisors supervisors in San Francisco. There is a data group in San Francisco that takes a look at that and tries to figure out, um, you know, like where, how, how is that related to our numbers? And I know that they just had a big presentation, I think in 20, 20 I think reviewing the numbers of 21 to 2022. And I think that is something that you can kind of Google to look at what those numbers look at. So I think when you're talking about and it, and this is me like trying to understand what you're talking about, Stephen, is um, those numbers, obviously, the whole reason why we're trying to get these numbers right is based on um, what to do for a budget, right? Like, where are we going to allocate our the, the city's budget moving forward? And, um, and so when they're looking at those numbers, they're they're looking at those numbers to see, okay, do we need to expand this program a little bit more because they were able to reach so many more people? Do we expand SCRT a little bit more because they were able to reach the, you know, that many people and maybe they needed, you know, here's what the team or here's what the Department of Public Health is saying that he, here's where the, the gaps are, right? I think right now, and it's, and it's not a secret, the big gaps that's happening right now is, yes, we have all of these crisis teams and all of these people, but now the big gap between us and getting them services is the that um, those services that that building has never changed. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? I might be losing myself as well, but um, let's say as far as like behavioral health services, they're all in this big old building, right? Behavioral health services, we're, 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 this is what we're looking at. I don't know the data of what's in this big building of behavioral health services and and this is mainly talking about clinics um talking about um the different agencies that actually hold like inpatient outpatient that's what i'm thinking about there and then you have your crises right so you have your crises teams that gets gets them to this building and now you have multiple teams that get them to this building um but this building again has never changed size has never changed shape We've, we, we had two doors and now with all these team, we have eight doors, but this building never got bigger. So when we're looking at like, um, I forget the word that you use, Stephen, but when we're looking at that data, it is the board of supervisors and it is the mental health commission that does look at that data and figures out um, how the data works with each other. Oh my gosh, that was so long-winded. I'm sorry, but 
I was trying to make sense of it. So did that make sense? And did that answer your question? But again, um, there is a website, there is a page on San Francisco Department of Public Health, or maybe it's um, SFGov, where they have all this data and all the presentations that they've ever presented to the Mental Health Commission. Yeah, and Chris, I really appreciate that. And uh, maybe it may be something that I, I slash we all can take a close look at. And maybe okay. when I throw out transformational data off the cuff, maybe I could maybe rephrase that to like impact data. Um, for example, let's say I, you know, I had a situation. Somebody says, "Oh, Stephen, uh, instead of getting five one fifty, Stephen goes to a, some other program." Then, how? What type of impact data do we know that? Hey, it's a fifty one fifty. If it was assigned to me, that changed my life because now I everything was beautiful from that. You know, from uh, that or, we, we, we don't it was have, a different program. We don't. We don't you know, have that uh, data readily handy, mm -hmm. except for those that are high utilizers by the police, um, they actually have some of that data where it shows like, oh, John Doe was 5150 last year, um, 13 times, but this year it went down to four. Mm -hmm. So is that due to the programs? For us on the inside of crisis, we have not tracked that data. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, and thanks for all the collective effort to to that. And I know Arnella is uh, also probably has a thing to add. So thank you again. Arnell, you have a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Actually, if um, I can ask Cheryl to go back to a slide, um, okay. I think it was locations of visits. Um, and I think, like most people, I'm very visual. And, and I remember seeing these orange dots on a San Francisco area map. I, I, I forget what slide you're on, but uh, I think it's locations of CCS visits. Let me see. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You, you, what caught my eye was, because I believe that to be Treasure Island. Yes. And I noticed its circle is as big as the one in Mission. Now, having been to TI, that's not densely populated like Mission. Are you, am I to infer that they had the same number of visits? So I think it's per, so it says per 10,000, right? So let's say, where's the the number for oh, Okay, I see the per so, 10,000, okay. Right, right. So that's why I think it looks a little bit bigger. Okay, that helps. 14, so it's 50% of the population at Treasure Island. So that's why that- That's, that's why it's so big. Right, right. That's interesting, okay. Right. Oh, well, thank you. I, that, I just, it kind of seemed like we went through it quickly and I- Yeah. Okay, that that's helpful though. Okay, so it's per, based on that. Okay, thank you. I just needed some clarification. And I think one thing that um, I forgot to mention, oops, okay, sorry. Um, one thing I forgot to mention was that um, how our program um, runs. So we have two clinicians who are um, who go out into the field to do the assessment. So, and then they always, always 100% of the time consult with the supervisor back in the office. So they present the case and then we work with the clinicians, the family, the either the provider, the client to create a disposition, to create a safety plan. So that safety plan could include a hospitalization to so that's the highest level, right? Is hospitalization, the most acute where, or we could just leave them on site. They're okay. We'll check in with them later on this afternoon, but it has to be a consensus. Um, so let's say the two clinicians who go out. So I use the term clinicians pretty broadly. So when I say clinician, it could be a psychologist, it could be a nurse, it could be a health worker. Um, I could I should say crisis specialist, basically. So it's a broader, broader description. So the crisis specialist, um, anybody in those disciplines that who are who are in our department, come to the consensus that hey, this person meets criteria. So Neftali can, and I can go out in the field. He'll say, no, I don't think so. And I said, no, yes, she does. So then we go back to um, our director or whoever the supervisor is, and we, we kind of like state our case um, and say, okay, this is what I think. This is what they think. And then we all come to a, a consensus. 
to make sure that the client gets the best care. So that's very important to know that when we're going out in the field, it's just not one single person's decision what's going to happen clinically, because um, that's a lot of responsibility um, on one individual. And we also, um, when we're headed back into the field, we're doing a lot of debriefings and debriefings and talking to one another, kind of like, what did we experience? How did that feel for us? Because it is a very traumatic job um, and not traumatic job, but a very intense job that could lead to burnout. Um, so it's very important that um, as a supervisor, I make sure that the staff is okay um, and that we're that everybody is safe. So um, safety is our number one um, priority when doing assessments. Um, do you have a question, Ms. Dury? I think you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, huh. Cheryl. <laughs> um, and, and to any other commissioners, if somebody wants to chime in with a question, feel free to uh, go at it. And, and Cheryl, um, actually, uh, for, that last, those last few comments you made about being very thoughtful about your own staff, I appreciate that. Uh, it can be very intense. So so that I appreciate you just uh, uh, mentioning that. Uh, coming back a little bit and help remind me, I think you mentioned that your role is primarily operational, right? Um, and I'm just curious, just a nuts and bolts type of question because with the, the um, immediacy, the intricacies of the information incoming and making decisions, the triage, all that, uh, the system that you use is it homegrown or what or, or is it all, or is it from a vendor what what, what, what <laughs> you talking about the system is it I mean, not I don't, you know no 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 I know. get what you mean um a combination I want to say mm. um you know it's a uh, critical incidents uh training psychological first aid training um over 10 years of doing the job I have wonderful colleagues very experienced team um so it's a combination of everything. Uh, I, Dr. Creel could probably spe specifically state in terms of the modalities and the theories that um, that we use in crisis. Um, but a lot, you know, in terms of uh, therapy, like using a therapy had its solution focused therapy. So coming up with a um, problem solving and making sure that we're coming up with the best solution to help the, the situation. I think when people people get hired to uh, crisis services, we tell them you go to boot camp. You're going to have to learn the basic pragmatic uh, technology necessary to listen, to use your mental health assessment training, to do a mental uh, status examination, to understand your clinical orientation, and to have a safe and secure attachment approach to be able to hold the space because it's a traumatic situation. So you'll learn crisis theory and then, and then you will take calls, role play. That'll, that'll take you six weeks to do that before you start going out. And when you start going out, you start going out as an observer. You have to observe three child visits, three adult visits, have to participate as a second, then another six, uh, series of doing that until you can be become a lead. But most importantly, our in-service training all the time really requires that you have a sense of theory. What's your theor theoretical orientation? Are you psychodynamic? Are you cognitive behavioral? Are you existential? Or are you solution-based? And incorporate that. And so our we require case presentations of everybody that is part of the staff. And everyone is the same. If you notice that, that uh, slide, is a circulo, it's a circle. That means nobody is more important or less important than anybody else. We are all the same. We expect everybody to respond in a professional attachment oriented place to hold the space, to be able to take care of the crisis in the moment and also make sure that they're attended to and taken care of. Let me tell you something, CRT is no joke. People are dying out here day in and day out. People are dying because of fatalities, homicides, suicides, drive-by shootings. We're holding the space. We're taking care of the people up to 18 months. I, you, you, there's no data for that. There's no explanation of how that happens. That, have we turned the corner? Some people we pay for the funerals when we never see them again. Some people we say, and they, they come to us and they say, you know what? You're helping me heal. 
I am accepting the fact that my son is no longer here. Or we've got people who are so enraged that nobody is doing anything for them to resolve the homicide because it may take five years to get resolution that we have to listen, be available and, and be there for them so that they can have go back to some level of functioning, uh, some, some kind of care. Is there data for that? Can we explain that? I don't think so. It's the quality of care. And it's, this is not for everybody. Not everybody cuts it here. Not everybody can make it here. So we take, we make sure we do everything we can about training people, giving them the competencies, getting them in the field, doing debriefings and evaluations, doing performance evaluations like you do in every HR, but can they fit into the team? Are you committed to taking care of city and county residents? That's the job. I kind of just wanted to say something too, just kind of about that a little bit, Stephen, and I know I'm kind of like in different roles here, but um, it is homegrown. So if you do look at that that thing where, where we talked about our staff and how we all come with our cultural differences, that makes a big difference with our treatment. Like we really do take that to heart. When, when, when people, we start with our practice right from when you walk into that door. Like we take you as a person, you know, as a clinician, as a crisis specialist coming in, what can you bring to the clinic? What can you bring to the public? Like what stuff about you that could help us with this clinic? And our, our clinic, it's very unique. It's constantly changing, constantly changing. Um, it's one of the big reasons why we have a new data person, our own data person, not a data person from the city or from, um, you know, like some, some other overseeing arch our own data so that we can constantly look at our own data in real time to figure out how we, how we can constantly make our services better. So we're constantly learning. We're constantly trying out new methods. We're constantly taking the expertise from our staff. Our, our staff are, you know, they, I think Neftali had said it, Dr. Shivika had said it, you know, Neftali is also doing SCRT. SCRT is the San Francisco program modeled after CAHOOTS in Oregon, right? So he's actually bringing his expertise as well from SCRT, what he's learned there into crisis and vice versa. I'm, I'm sure he's also bringing stuff he's learned from crisis also to SCRT. And you could talk about that a little bit more, Neftali. And same thing with Dr. Shivika. You know, she is also part of the Berkeley crisis team. There's things that I think she's bringing also to, to our team that she may also be bringing to her team out in Berkeley. So that's it. It starts with our staff and, you know, our, our director, um, Stephanie Felder, who said she's been here for 28 years. Um, that definitely goes to say how dedicated, for some reason, it works in, in, in the clinic, right? Um, crisis services, it's, it's been historically known to know that it's a high turnaround job. Not very many people stay for very long. But for some reason, in our clinic, people have been there 20 plus years, 15 plus years. Like, I think maybe possibly the average, even though we just got a new flux of new, new crisis specialists, um, before that, I think the average was about maybe definitely plus, 10 years plus, which is kind of outrageous in, in, in the crisis world. But um, something works. We, we can't quite describe it. We don't have data for it, like Dr. Ricardo had said. But for some reason, it's working. And our program has constantly been expanding, as you can see from you know the history of from being a nonprofit in an emergency room now to being this big, huge umbrella to even having community wellness be part of it. Um, it's, it's always changing. So it is homegrown. Um, we don't have, you know, like a presentation on here's what it looks like, but we know it's here somewhere. I, I, nobody's ever had to like put it down. So on paper to figure out, you know, what that looks like, but um, maybe that's something we should do. Yeah, maybe it's <laughs> something I think we about do. it. <laughs> Right. But, but like I said, it does come from right, right from when they enter the door and, and maybe Neftali and, and Dr. Shiva could talk a little, could talk a little bit more about that, about, you know, the model and, and, and how it's different from their other entities that they work at. Don't be shy. 
<laughs> so my name is Neftali. Uh, like um, uh, Crystal Henbade mentioned, I have uh, been working with street crisis response teams since April of 2021. And um, so basically it had started out as a outdoor program um, attending to people in crisis out in the street. So it was a base street uh, based program. Uh, the majority of our clients that we saw were unhoused, uh, experiencing crisis outdoors for whatever reason. So it can be anything from uh, drug-induced psychosis, uh, weather-induced, um, domestic disputes outside, um, clients being in front of businesses that the business owners wanted them to move. Um, so just a variety of, of uh, calls that we would uh, respond to. In its initial concept, uh, when it came online in November 2021, um, there was approximately, I think the pilot phase just ended here in, I wanna say in September of 2022, uh, approximately 20,000 calls were handled through the 911 system. Um, also other calls that uh, came through were through OnView. So this means that the triadic team that was consisting of a mental health clinician, a paramedic, and a peer support specialist would drive around in the city and would encounter people in crisis in the street. So uh, they then would uh, attend to that crisis and uh, support that client in, um, in their environment. So that whether that would be uh, a person experiencing homelessness and wanting to get shelter, uh, every day with the street crisis response team, we are allotted, uh, allotted uh, beds through the city's um, shelters. So if there is availabilities um, and somebody is wanting to uh, get out of the street for whatever reason, uh, those arrangements could be made um, to get them out of the street. Um, if there is medical needs, the paramedic can do uh, an assessment, a triage to find out if they're uh, if anything organic is happening with the client and um, call for an ambulance. Um, the peer support specialist is there to uh, empathize with our unhoused community, um, ho hopefully offer some support and um, you know, be an assistance however they can support the client. Um, th typically the way that I have told, uh, done some presentations here with street crisis response team and um, it, it, it kind of is a rapid response crisis de-escalation team, right? So as opposed to comprehensive crisis being a little bit more, um, you know, doing, getting our collateral information, uh, then attempting to go out and, and, and talk to the client. The street crisis response team is just like a paramedic, um, an ambulance responding to a medical scene, not knowing exactly what the situation is and responding, uh, responding to the, the crisis. 90% uh, of the time, it doesn't come out to the way that it's presented originally. So we come out to a crisis with uh, completely different information, or maybe the, even the client will be presenting in a completely different way um, when we arrive. And so that's uh, part of the dynamic that we have is to be able to take care of each other by looking at the scenes, sizing it up and determining if this is a, uh, a you know, a client that is safe to approach and potentially engage. If we find that it's not, then uh, we do ask for police backup at that point. Um, again, if there is a medical need, we also have the capabilities of transporting our clients to different clinics uh, around the city to address those medical needs. And that can be anything from acute care uh, to any chronic conditions, uh, or if there is availabilities at any of our CSUs or any respite sites, such as our hummingbird programs, uh, we can take them to them and uh, or to those those locations, and they can uh, you know they can be at those locations uh, for whatever uh, amount of time that the location lets them stay there. Um, we do have direct referral programs, such as uh, Harbor Lights program, uh, Door Clinic. Uh, hummingbird that we can make direct referrals to if they wish to have uh, overnight, um, you know, services at these programs, we can do direct referrals. Um, what else is there? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, 
we do have the capability of working with police. I will say that through my experience, um, the collaboration that we have with comprehensive crisis is a lot better than we do with street crisis. I don't know if that happens to be because of the, the fire department street uh, or, or police department dynamics or not, but it's just that we train with the police department here as opposed to street crisis response team. We do not train with the police. So I, I would attribute um, you know, the collaboration that we have with comprehensive crisis to be um, a lot better with the police. And I think that reflects, uh, especially when we go out in the field. Um, yeah, is there any other questions that you may have for me in regards to maybe the differences? And I know Shiva could probably can, can, can offer a, a bit of uh, you know, differences as well that she sees in her area, but... Um, And I, I just kind of wanted to say too is Neftali is going to do a presentation on SCRT in the future, um, so so we will be seeing him again. If I may, um, Neftali, I uh, thank you for adding any of your perspectives here. And there's actually two things you should you should have quite a bit as well. There are two things that's uh, kind of um, sticking in my head with you know, with you. Um, oh, oh, let's see. Sorry, I have to talk out loud. I took my notes, but I'll say the 20,000, I heard 20,000 calls per day. Did, did I hear that correctly? 20,000 uh, calls per day? Twenty. I'm sorry if I said mis, misspoke. It was 20,000 calls uh, a year. Oh, a year? Okay. <laughs> 20,000 calls a year. Yeah. Okay. So as of November um, 2022, we get uh, monthly updates. As of November 2022, we're about... 18,000 um, calls. And, and again, these calls are all kind of depending if we do on views or we get them through the EMD, through dispatch. Um, so roughly about 20,000 have kind of come out since the inception of this program. So and another thing I wanted to talk about was just, I'm sorry, did you have another question before I talked about something else? Uh, yeah, well, I had a question around that, but if you wanted to add to, to, to uh, finish off your, your thought, feel free. Okay, so like I was talking about, the pilot phase um, had just recently ended here in September of 2022. Uh, phase two included uh, going over to the EMD system. So that means that we had originally gotten dispatch with every rig being assigned different parts of the city. Uh, now, uh, because it's now a predominantly 911 dispatch system, uh, we get dispatched kind of like ambulances. So if we're in the vicinity of a call, we get dispatched to that. We do have a 15 minute time limit, meaning that if we are unable to respond to this crisis, uh, they will go ahead and dispatch an ambulance. There are instances that an ambulance will get dispatched with us at the same time. And just depending on the call itself and the description, uh, we might actually even get a police officer to, to, uh, to get dispatched with us at the same time, just to make sure that the scene is safe. Okay. Well, that, that, actually, that's it's interesting that you added that because that kind of, you, you must be reading my mind a little bit because I had a question that kind of relates to what you just added. Um, momentarily, if I may go back to the, the 20,000 uh, that you clarified on roughly uh, approximate for the years, um, I'm, I'm going to make a commentary. I would love your thoughts on my commentary. You want to heard that. Well, now though I know it's a year, not a day, but, but still in and of itself, I was going, wow, 20,000. And I'm going, wow, in two ways. I'm going, Wow. That's great because it seems like there's an awareness. People are tapping into it, right? And so the, there's that one upside. I'm thinking it might be awareness. And then I'm thinking on the other side, 20,000. Wow. And I'm wondering, there's 20, for lack of better words, there's 20,000 problems. Um, and is, it, is this a reactionary kind of a outlet? Or so is this a good or bad number? What, do you, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, it's just everybody describes crisis in a different way, right? So what may be a crisis to me may not be a crisis to somebody else. So a lot of the calls that we do get, uh, especially in the morning, we do have a lot of our unhoused uh, community members um, being in front of businesses, for instance. Uh, the business opens up at eight o'clock and someone's kind of spent the night and they'll call 911 because they're trying to get this house member uh, out in front of their, their front steps. So um, when that happens, uh, we go out and provide uh, resources to this person if they're wanting to shelter or, you know, as comfortable as it is, 
um, and it's not our job that we move people along, uh, we give them different alternatives to see if, uh, if they're interested in those services. Um, you know, because sometimes the actual crisis itself isn't our clients. When we go to respond to some of these calls, the crisis itself is the actual person that's calling. And so they happen to be more in crisis than the actual client itself. So we do a lot of, you know, community engagement and probably a little education to our, um, you know, neighbors that are, you know, have businesses or even homes that are uh, complaining of unhoused people being in front of their house or on the sidewalk. So just having to educate them as far as what, you know, what the laws uh, prohibit us from doing and the rights of our community members that are unhoused. You know, they're able to, 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 to be in these areas. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's a good uh, metric that we're getting these many calls because, you know, like I mentioned, it's a lot of them get unreported, but the ones that we do respond to, uh, even though this person may not be in crisis at the moment, it opens up um, other resources that other, you know, they may not be uh, privy to. So like shelters or medical services or anything else that the city's, um, you know, is willing to offer them. They may not, you know, be in the know at the moment, but with us responding, they now have the, the resources to obtain those services in the future. Thank you. Welcome. Amy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would love to ask as the staff liaison for the commission, one question that's top of mind. I don't know if this is difficult to answer, but in line with sort of uh, Neftali, as you were talking about responding with an officer, I'm wondering across the different programs, some co-respond with an officer or can call an officer for backup. Some seem to not. Have you all perceived different pros and cons from programs that are working with a police officer and programs that are working without? Hmm. I'm going to just jump in real quick. A little bit of my background is working with Berkeley Mobile Crisis, and I've been doing that since 2005, and that team does co-respond. Um, I unfortunately didn't, don't have any stats um, off the top of my head, but we co-respond with police the majority of the time. Um, in the last few years, it's been Oh. Um, it's been 100% of the time. We have a police radio with us. We start our shift at their briefing um, and we get dispatched just like they do. So an officer will go to a scene um, for whatever. It could be somebody who has dementia. It could be um, a 5150 evaluation. It could be a parent calling about a child that's out of control. Um, Sometimes we'll correspond with also fire if there's an issue, if there's like a structural fire happening and they need assistance with the residents who are having a hard time um, when there's a dead body and family members are showing up. So a, a whole slew of things um, we will respond and you know, there are pros and cons to it. And it depends, I think, also on the police officers and the agency. Um, Berkeley has been really, really helpful. They have really good um, de-escalation techniques. And I've had really good experiences with them on sometimes the officer has the better relationship because they're the one in the uniform. I'm not one in the uniform. Um, and sometimes I have a better relationship and the officer is just kind of moving back. Um, the relationship with the Berkeley Mobile Crisis Team and um, Berkeley Police Department is been going on since the 80s. So as soon as new officers come in, they're getting taught like how to pull on MH um, and how to interact with us. So we're teaching them and they're teaching us. Um, I know for a lot of people, they don't, they want more of an SCRT model like Nathalie was talking about. Um, and I do think Berkeley is going to be starting that type of model as well for our unhoused population. Um, was there a specific question around kind of pros and cons that I could help answer? No, just trying to gather more information um, because our program is currently housed in the police department. Mm -hmm. um, but in the future, I think we're looking to learn from multiple models. 
I know, so Berkeley Mobile Crisis is not housed in the police department, um, but we are really well connected to the police, you know, via the police radio. Um, and we also on our iPhones have um, an app called Shield Force. So as soon as I'm listening to radio traffic, I can pull up the details of the call and sometimes sitting in the office knowing that like, it's John Doe and I know that name, let me look it up in my system and doing a little bit of research if I'm in the office. If I'm not in the office, um, I'm often in the field. Um, so it's still helpful to have just the details of what's happening in the call on the phone. Um, I also work Marin Mobile Crisis and that is not in a police station as well, but we do get calls from dispatch from all, it's a countywide mobile crisis team um, and their dispatches, San Rafael, Nevada, all the cities uh, will call us to see if we can help co-respond or will even call us just to say, hey, here's a phone number, um, call them and see what you can do over the phone. And then we'll, we'll respond with you if you need to. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I think to elaborate a little bit more on your question, Amy, is um, uh, the public, this is something that like, um, that does happen. When we do get referrals from the public, sometimes the public will specifically say to us, um, I want you guys to come out rather than police coming out. That that happens quite a bit. Um, and in, in, in some instances, I mean, it is appropriate for us to, to come out, you know, um, you know, there's, there, there's, there's no threat of, uh, of, of violence or aggression or anything like that. If it seems like it's a safe case, then it's definitely something that we can go out on, but hands down, if there's, if there's a weapon involved, if it is dangerous, if there's history of violence, um, we will not go there without police. If there's an inkling that we have, um, that this may get aggressive, Sometimes we'll have police officers um, staging nearby, stand standing by, maybe just even on the other side of the door where um, the patients don't necessarily see the police. They see us first. Um, and then once we, you know, feel like, okay, I think, I think we're safe, um, then then we'll definitely call them off. But um some of the difficulties that we've had with uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know if I should say call it difficulties, but um there is a new law that is out, which is unless there is a crime being committed in, in a home, police will not break down that door. So if we are trying to get somebody who is on a, who we do want to put on a hold because they are a danger to themselves, danger to others, or they are gravely disabled and they are not willing to come with us, that's kind of where things get a little gray. Um, police will not pull that person out or drag that person out, nor, nor will they break down that door. And same thing for us. So there are uh, limitations to what we can do in, in that regard. And just because they are law enforcement, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to break down that door or drag that person out. So, you know, that's still something that I think um, not just not just crisis, but everybody like that's that that has been a big game changer to the entire field in general. So um, that is something that is still a little difficult to kind of work around. And additionally, I would add to what Crystal said is um, working with the police, you get that collateral information that otherwise you probably wouldn't know about the client. So that happens to be a very great asset that we have out in the field is having our fellow officers that are uh, you know, potentially know a little bit more about the clients and potentially what their triggers are, right? Because maybe it is police that gets them triggered. So we might get that information when we're trying to engage with the client and uh, we'll be the first ones on there to try to engage with them. Um, sometimes we don't have that information when we respond with street crisis and, um, you know, th 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 we'll find out that maybe um, they are triggered by police and it's a good thing that we responded or if we correspond with police, we'll, we'll let them know that, you know, if they can just hang back. Uh, one of the things that um, is a little bit different with uh, comprehensive crisis is that we have that collateral information, uh, you know, the majority of the time is that uh, we know what potentially could be the triggers for these clients and we go prepared. So we make sure we have the right resources for the job that we're ready to walk into. 
And I, I wonder if that's different for, for Mika and for, for Chief Campbell, if they actually have access to the a, a behavioral um, database. Um, Chief Campbell, do you, do you know if that Mika has access to that? Is she able to look up collateral information for a patient that she's about to see on site? Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, uh, Mika does have access to a uh, San Jose County Behavioral Health uh, as well as the uh, the county hospital records. Thank you, Chief Campbell. Well, I'll, I'll guess I'll just come back <laughs> with another <laughs> question. Even, uh, right, uh, and, and yeah, this is, is really uh, really has me uh, you know even much more. Um, Curious, um, and and I know Natalie uh, was mentioning there was a second question, partially what you uh, mentioned and re revisited in terms of the collaboration, and maybe to a little bit of the point with Shivika, uh, the pros and cons, and um, uh, that in response to Amy, uh, maybe in a broader question from what you've experienced so far and what you're first seeing, um, is there something that you system wise, process wise, that you when you look back as a man. Or you know, boy, uh, we should not have done that. You know, what what would be some landmines as we're trying to figure our process out? Um, you know, our model. What would be a landmine? You said, don't even go there because it just was painful, a headache. Um, I know it's a very broad question, but what have you ex experientially recognized that you wouldn't just not do again because? Um, I, I'm struggling a little bit to answer that question because I'm not sure, um, there's a, there's a lot of things. This and... one is fine. They're like the top one systems wise, whatever that, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying individually necessarily, but everybody's just sensed it, it's, you know, kind of like that, that magnitude is like, oh, wow. Yeah. I think for me, for me personally, if there's ever an inkling of there's a safety component, to not having law enforcement involvement, even like Crystal said, if they're behind the door, having that talk, having that talk with my partner um, in Marin and Berkeley, I actually do respond by myself sometimes. Um, sometimes we co-respond, sometimes I'm responding by myself. Um, either way, if there's just any kind of inkling, um, I'm just not gonna chance it. And I have been in situations where I walked in and I was like, oh, this seems fine. And then two seconds later was like, this is not, not fine. And instead of backing out to ask for law enforcement support, um, just feeling like I had to finish the call. Um, so that that's my kind of one thing. <laughs> yeah, and I wanna piggyback off of what Shivaka said. Um, as a supervisor, that's like the number one concern. It's not something wrong but it's something that I'll always do is to make sure that everybody in the room is safe safety is like the number one priority you know I think it's human nature when we see people in crisis is that we want to we want to help them right we want to provide what we believe is what the client wants and so sometimes um, when we attempt to engage clients we provide or offer services that they're not interested in. And so because of our helpful nature and the business that we're in, uh, we think that we know what's best for our clients. So being trauma-informed and providing the resources to what the client is requesting is sometimes a little bit difficult to separate the two is when you see somebody in crisis, when you see somebody in need and you're offering that support and it's not what they're looking for. Um, so, you know, and, and same thing with Shivika said, and, you know, safety is paramount. And so just having that different perspective, having, uh, those different sets of eyes that you probably overlooked, but your, your colleague was, um, you know, privy to, or they were able to have that bird's eye view that you possibly missed is, is, is critical. And I think that's where, you know, where it, it, it's very important to have a colleague with you to make sure that you get that, that look especially when you, when you start going indoors, um, because then it becomes very constricted or very restricted when you start going inside one of these SROs or uh, buildings that are very constricted or restricted. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, the safety aspect of it is, is very important. 
and, and, and I just kind of want to highlight something, you know, when people call 911 and they're, they're getting a hold of dispatch, the questions that dispatch is asking is for the safety of the officers, right? Like, are there any weapons? Like, I mean, they, they are thinking about the patients as well, but they're also thinking about their, their officers. So our the safety of our staff, because, you know, if that person's in a crisis, they're, they're obviously not hurting in that moment because they're not calling 911 or it's not that life threatening or it's not to that point where it's life threatening where 911 needs to be called immediately. Um, and that's something that we determine on the front end too when we're triaging these calls is does 911, is this an emergency versus is this a crisis? But is the safety of our staff, when, when PD does come out with us, when police do come out with us, a lot of the time, not majority of the time, but a lot of the time, it is for the safety of our team. It is for the safety of our clinicians. So that, yeah, safety, I think, is like the biggest number one thing. And I think that's one of the greatest things about comprehensive crisis is, again, we do have that really close relationship with the with the, the police department. And, you know, I'm, I, I think you're going to hear from Lieutenant Molina, who is this, the CRT supervisor for, of San Francisco PD, um, the CIT team. He is going to present in the future. But, um, you know, he does talk quite a bit about how our relationship uh, between crisis and, and PD has really changed things um, with how we respond to crises in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And anything from Ms. Felder or Dr. Ricardo? Do you guys have any input about that to Stephen's question? Just wanted to make sure there was an opportunity there. Well, I think you covered it, or you all covered it. Cool. Any other questions? And again, this is just like an open conversation, you know. Um, Obviously, they're, they're, we'll, we'll have direct access to the comprehensive crisis team. So if there are like other questions in the future or even, you know, just like thoughts or um, anything that you guys might think of, um, we, we can definitely take it back to the team and have them answer that. If there's data that you want, um, that's something that we could possibly pool. I'm sure that we could get that to the team as well. So this isn't like the, the end of this conversation with comprehensive crisis. I'm sure it'll continue on. Um, Next month, we do have Berkeley crisis presenting as well. So um, this is gonna be a, a, a constant thing, right? We wanna make sure that we're doing our due diligence to learning about these other crises models um, around our neighboring cities so that we can uh, help our city and count, city council figure out um, how to expand our, our, our pilot program. So just wanted to bring that back that this was, that's the whole point, right? But yeah. And any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, perfect. Okay, so I know that we're coming up on almost two hours. Um, I think we're gonna take a break, but before we do that, thank you so much Comprehensive Crisis for being here, for your input and your expertise. Uh, I definitely appreciate it. Um, Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, so I think it is a perfect time to take a break. I know it's been a long one. Um, is everybody okay with a break? Maybe like a 10, 15 minute break? Is everybody I'm okay, okay. We just keep rolling. <laughs> yes, yeah, let's going? just keep rolling. Let's keep going. Okay. All right. Is everybody else okay with that? All right. Okay, perfect. All right. So I think next on the agenda, we have um, we have the election of chair and vice chair. Perfect. Go ahead, Amy. Thanks, Crystal. So as we uh, prepped you guys last time, according to the ordinance creating the commission, we're supposed to elect a chair and vice chair at the first meeting, but then from there, the first January meeting of every year. Um, so our current chair and vice chair have served since June, um, but we now need to elect a chair and a vice chair for 2023 that'll run for one year. 
You are able to re-elect the same chair and vice chair if you so choose. Um, the nomination process, um, we can either, if we just want to make one nomination and take a vote, we can do that. Or if people would like to make multiple new nominations, we can um, go to a bit of a ballot on a Google form and process it that way. So, uh, Stephen, did you have a clarifying question? Yeah. Oh, um, why did it look at my face? Did it look? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to understand the process. So, you know, um, what if what if some what I'm just understanding if somebody's being nominated and they, and the person is not able to not available to is that considered? I mean, I'm just yes. curious. Is it like is it like okay, Amy, you're it, and it's period, or um, how does that work? <laughs> I think we do ask the person nominated if they are willing to serve. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so I will open the floor to any nominations. Well, I'd like to nominate Crystal again for uh, chair. Yeah, me too. Me as well. Crystal, would you accept this nomination? I, yes, I'm, I'm so dedicated to this, this portion of what we're doing right now with the commission. So yes, I will. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, um, we can proceed with a roll call vote unless would anyone else like to make a nomination? Uh, I'd like to nominate Arnell. I would also like to nominate Arnell. Are we talking chair or vice chair? I think we're on chair. He's all choked up. <laughs> <laughs> Arnell, would you accept this nomination? I'm, I'm moved by it. I'm, I'm thinking. Um, I'm, I'm on a spot here. Um, I, I, I'm inclined to decline. I mean, I feel like we've gotten we've made some good headway with Crystal. I, I don't necessarily want to change the captain on the ship right now. That's just me. So I'm, I appreciate it, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna decline. I'm gonna, but thank you. Um, so, but my my vote is still for Crystal to be chair. I just remind you that it is a team effort. Does it really matter who's vice or chair? <laughs> okay. Any other nominations? Okay, um, I'll do a roll call vote. So we had a motion and a second to nominate Crystal as chair. Um, so we'll do a vote. Commissioner Yi. Yes. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> Sorry. Is that the right option answer? Yes. Okay, thank you. So yes. <laughs> Commissioner Sanders. Yes. Commissioner Perez. Yes. Commissioner Hobson Cord. Yes. Commissioner Junio. Yes. Commissioner Delgadillo. Yes. And Commissioner Cancino. Abstain. Can I abstain? I feel like I should. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, motion passes. Crystal Cantino will be the 2023 chair. Congrats. Okay, so for vice chair, do we have any nominations? I'd like to nominate Arnell. I second that. I agree. Arnell, would you accept this nomination? 
Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Any other nominations? Can, can I put in an, a second nomination or do, can I only do one? Um, we can do a second nomination. I also want to nominate Stephen. Um, Stephen, would you accept this nomination? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Um, at this point, I will not accept it at, at this time. But I, I, I greatly appreciate it, especially coming from Crystal. Thank you. I'm going to, I need to decline. Any other nominations? Okay, we'll go through a roll call vote. Um, Commissioner, uh, so for the motion to nominate Arnell to be vice chair, um, I'll do the same order of voting. So Commissioner Yi? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Perez? Yes. Commissioner Hobson Cord? Yes. Commissioner Junio? Oh, yeah, for yourself, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Delgadillo? Yes. And Commissioner Cantino? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Arnell will be the 2023 vice chair. Thanks all. Cool, perfect. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just wanna say, I think we're just gonna continue on doing the same work that we've been doing. I, I feel like we're kind of on a roll at this point, so. And we're getting really close to the, um, keeping the eyes on the prize, we're really getting close, I think. Cool, all right, so next agenda item um, is future agenda items. Does anybody have recommendations for any future agenda items? You know, Crystal, just, just brief, I'm not sure it's necessary a, a agenda item slot. I'm just, I'm just curious, and you know, I, I'm this is just my like, third or whatever uh, in this session here. But I'm noticing that as we explore different, um, you know, groups and agencies, which is really valuable. Like like we have, what was coming up next? Berkeley, right? Berkeley's coming up next. Yeah, right? Ber Berkeley and SCRT. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm just curious because it's all, it's, it, I'm thinking uh, it might be helpful to have some sort of scorecard of sorts so that as we look at each one, I know that each one has their own nuances and variances, but at least we have some base point of uh, core things that we meant, we really really uh, capture in, in part of our assessments or or, or um, cross checking. I, 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 for some reason, I think that would be just helpful. Um, thoughts? Yeah, I'm 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 totally on the same page with you. Like definitely a scorecard, but more so, you know, so something that I was hoping that we had started maybe from the beginning was having like discussion time after these presenters talk where we can kind of like sit there and kind of, you know, for ourselves decipher the information that we just, that we just learned of. And, and especially since Chief Campbell does come on these meetings so often and staff from South San Francisco come on these meetings so often, I feel like it's a great opportunity to kind of, you know, just think about the information that they had sent, you know, given us again, like as, as, as simple as the question of, does Mika have, you know, access to the database for behavior health, right? The same way that crisis can get collateral information. Does Mika also have that, you know? Um, so yeah, just like discussion time after this. So I'm totally on board with you having a scorecard. Let's make sure we're like getting together and asking the same questions that we want to know. Like, I think, um, I think it was Alameda that had brought it. Um, and, and Mika also had brought it, but I don't think comprehensive crisis did. And um, I know SCRT plans to, but budget, right? That's something that I think we you've you've been really good at that, Stephen. I think Stephen and um, and and Alan has been really good, and Sal as well actually have been good about talking about the budget and like what does that look like for these cities and how much that costs to run their program. So totally agree with you as far as far as having a tally system. Here's the basic information we want from each from each you know for each program, each agency, so that that can help us, right? Yeah. Is is that something that everybody um, would find beneficial? 
moving forward, let's start slotting in in the agenda discussion time after these presentations where we could talk amongst ourselves a little bit to kind of like process the information we just learned. I definitely would like to talk about what we're going to do with the information that we're learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be good with the discussion as well. Yeah. Yeah, so if I can jump in, um, definitely want to bring information back um, for in one place for you all as we think about moving forward. And we'll be writing staff reports, bringing some stuff back and giving some like alternatives and putting things in like where it would especially be great to have commissioner input. Um, so there will be staff reports coming and information being brought back to help you move to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know at one point too, you know, we did have our subcommittees and I think that that's something that we can kind of restart. Maybe the mental health subcommittee can look at all these different presentations since we do have their presentations, you know, e emailed to us. We can look at that and think of, you know, how that could be helpful for us when we're, you know, thinking about what are our, what our recommendations are to city council on how to expand the pilot program, like what, what that would look like. And here's what we liked from this agency. Here's what we might not, it doesn't make sense for our city, right? Like I feel like for, for SCRT or, you know, for people who are unhoused, I don't, I don't believe we have a huge unhoused population in South San Francisco. I don't believe so. We may, I'm not quite sure. And maybe that's a question for, you know, city council or, or, or whoever's doing that, but, you know, maybe the focus of, uh, services focused on unhoused um, communities might not be something that we need to really hone in on or focus on. But I, I, again, I think we, we're going to have that data from the garden center happening next month as well. So we'll be able to dissect that information to see, you know, what, what kind of services are needed in South San Francisco, what kind of services are already being utilized in South San Francisco. Yeah, to add that, um, uh, staff had advised me to have you guys see the experts first and then get the data presentation so you have a little bit more context and maybe more questions to ask of the data. I'm very excited for them to come to the next meeting. It'll be both Mika and the Gardner Center, as well as Captain Plank, I think, who supervises Mika. Um, Alan or Commissioner Perez, I know you've asked in the past about seeing reports early, so I'm going to ask if we can send those out before the next meeting. Um, but yeah, that's another big upcoming thing that should happen in February. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I think the, the next coming agendas will have um, a slot for discussion and how that's relatable to what our job is as far as you know taking things back to city council um the the thing that carol had brought up do we need to vote on that amy no, no I, staff will take that direction okay, perfect all right um last item items from commission and staff Any questions? Oh, you got it. Oh, okay. I see. Do you have any questions? If anything, I think. Um, so we're resuming our normal uh, schedule meetings now? As far as the yes. calendar? Yes, but next month will also be on a Tuesday just because the Monday is President's Day, I believe. Okay. So just look for the invite for that meeting. Yeah, I think it's February 21st. Okay. It should it should have already been sent out because I do see it in my iCal. But um, yeah, February 21st, I think is the date that we had decided at that point. Is everybody still okay with that date? I'm, uh, short answer is yes. I might be running a, a late uh, at least half an hour, just so that you know. But I'll show, it'll be at the latter part. My apologies, early apologies. Anything else from commissioner, um, city staff? I just had two quick questions. 
Amy, how long are you staying on it still at this point? And the second thing is, uh, does anybody know about the new equity officer? Because I think we were thinking about waiting for the board retreat for that. That's what I recall. There we go. We got Leslie here. So we just were able to get the um, DEI officer position posted on Cal Ops this week. So we have a recruitment out there. And uh, as soon as that recruitment starts, we will get it going ASAP. We, we obviously don't want um, to lose Amy, but we know she needs to move on. And um, so we're right now it's on Cal Ops. So we'll just, you know, move that position. It's, it's uh, honestly, it's, it's a high priority for us. So as soon as we can get those applications in and get the interview process going, um, I'll be able to give you more information after that. Oh, it looks like we've lost Crystal. She just texted she's switching devices. Maybe we can just give it one minute. Um, any last questions or things people wanted to share? I will just share that it's nice to be seeing all of you on Zoom. I um, this this commission started when I was on maternity leave. And actually it started back in 2020 when I was on my first maternity leave. And then when it was formed, I had a second maternity leave. I had some back-to-back -back babies. So um, I, I now have um, a two and a half year old and a, a one-year-old. And um, so I'm just kind of getting back into the swing of things. And so um, it's nice to, to see, I've heard about you guys and I've heard great things. And it's nice to just be a part of listening in on this conversation. So um, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing. And Les is our deputy city manager. Okay, Crystal's back. Just trying to promote to panelists. And having an issue. It's kind of funny because the last thing to do is really just adjourn. <laughs> um, no disrespect to Crystal. Arnell's here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. Yes, let's adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks Sorry all. About that. All right, bye you guys. Have a good night. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night.